afternoon. Try now. Hey, it's much louder. Now I can use my radio voice. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, Small Sat Working Group. Um, today's session, uh, we have an, a, uh, a distinguished panel of Small Sat practitioners, experts, and aficionados. I found myself in the latter category. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of, of introducing our uh, moderator A for today. We have a moderator B that moderator A will actually introduce. Um, Rob Zitz is the uh, Lido's Senior Vice President and Strategic Account Executive for Intelligence and Homeland Security. Um, he's a career intelligence officer and he was uh, the first Deputy Undersecretary appointed in DHS where he guided DHS uh, cybersecurity, infrastructure protection, and national communications, state and local grants, exercises, and assessments, fire administration, ready gov, and the chief, uh, and the efforts of the chief medical officer. Now, I'm not sure if that's actually a title, um, but it looked pretty good. Um, Mr. Zitz also served as the first deputy associate director of the United States Secret Service. In that role, he guided transformation efforts needed to modernize the elite law enforcement agency. During his 32-year intelligence community career, um, Rob rose to the rank of SES 6 and held very significant positions in Army Intel, CIA, NGA, NSA, and NRO. He directed many of the intelligence community's trade studies, which led to funding of major programs and operation today. He led R&D efforts in NGA and NRO, including making the decision to invest in uh, that tiny little company you might have heard of called Keyhole, uh, which later became Google Earth. Uh, Rob is widely acknowledged for his uh, groundbreaking efforts to integrate disparate intelligence disciplines and what is commonly known as multi in today. Uh, Rob, and I can say this because I've worked with him on a number of different fronts uh, from the time he was uh, working with Pete Ristan um, to today. Um, he's a visionary leader who can really make a thought process and a vision turn into reality. So without further ado, Rob. Thanks a lot. <coughs> like kids say that when the introduction is longer than your presentation, it's time to retire. So, uh, what, I want to hold on to this. What we're going to do today is this is really meant to be a dialogue, but to set the stage, we're going to have each of these speakers give you just a few salient points about what they're doing and where they're headed. And we'll keep, uh, we'll keep them on time, actually, by, uh, I wanted to let you know if you hear this sound, that says we're at the two minute mark, and we're going to move through this, because the idea of us going forward is for you all to be talking to us, to each other, and for us to talk to each other about where we are with uh, this particular topic. Now, I do have the pleasure of doing some introductions here first. I want to start out first by acknowledging my uh, co-moderator. I think I uh, really don't need an introduction, but I'll give you one anyway, Jeff Scott Baxter. Uh, many of you are probably aware that uh, Jeff is most famously known for his time with the Steely Dan Doobie Brothers. But uh, as others in the band were reading, uh, let's just say, some not suitable for work uh, magazines, he was reading Aviation Week and Space Technology. And so over the years, it became known to the, to the, uh, to the Congress that he was actually a subject matter expert, self-taught, particularly in missile defense. In the 90s, he was brought in to work on some committees regarding missile defense, was cleared, brought into the intelligence community. We first met in the late 90s where he began supporting, uh, at that time, NEMA, then NGA. He's a key consultant and supports from the DNI on down virtually all of the intelligence community and a few of the uh, big industry players. He's an expert not only in missile defense and in intelligence uh, systems, but also in the use of data. So when you think about analysts and how analysts of the future will operate, uh, that's what Jeff's about. He's, uh, he's been a key thought leader on small sats as well. So as our co-moderator, his uh, deal will be after we've heard from these panelists, he's going to be a stimulant discussant to get the audience and the panelists and uh, myself talking about the issue of the moment. Sitting next to Scott, to his left, is Ann Hale Millerisi. Uh, Ann has been actively engaged in the remote sensing and GIS sciences for 28 years. She's worked in state and federal government as well as private sector 
engineering, management, consulting, remote sensing, and GIS companies. She's currently the president and CEO of Planet IQ, a Maryland-based atmospherics data sales company, which will operate a constellation of 12 small satellites in low Earth orbit. Uh, previously, Anne was principal director with Booz Allen, uh, managing geospatial service offerings across defense, intelligence, and civilian accounts, and was uh, prior to that president and CEO of Earth Data International. To Anne's left is Robbie Schlinger, co-founder and president of Planet Labs. Robbie is responsible for Planet Labs business and product development, investor relations, and financial and organizational operations. Prior to Planet Labs, Robbie spent nine years at NASA. He served as capture manager for the uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, and helped to formulate the small satellite office at NASA Ames. He had two tours at NASA headquarters, served as NASA's open government representative to the White House, and the White House recognized NASA as a model for openness in government based on his work and his team's work. He also served as a founding, on the founding team uh, as the chief of staff of the office of the chief technologist at NASA, where he incubated $650 million space technology program focusing on advanced technology. To his left is Andy Quintero. He's the principal engineer of the intellectual <coughs> property programs uh, segment of Aerospace Corporation, which includes technology transfer, patent licensing, and over a half dozen startups in the last decade he's been involved in. Uh, Andy's experience and exposure to people class satellites goes back over a decade while helping to build the industrial base for small satellites, uh, including those developing and flown by aerospace. Uh, Andy was also chairman of an international small satellite consortium for two years, and one outcome of that work was the International Launch Portal, which is a database that links payloads to potential launchers. Next to Andy on his left is uh, Dr. Jim Wirtz, who's the president of Microcosm. Uh, he has technical and management responsibility for work in Microcosm's main business area, which is space mission uh, engineering, low-cost space launch systems, autonomous nav navigation and control, satellite orbit attitude systems, space sensor design, and space software development. Under the direction of Jim, Microcosm has become a principal creator of practical solutions to reduce both space mission costs and launch costs. Uh, Jim uh, is also the editor and principal author of several of the most widely used spacecraft textbooks. Many of the engineers, whether it be NASA, NRO, Air Force, others, uh, learned under your tutelage and certainly from your uh, textbooks, Jim. There'll be a quiz after that. Absolutely. So the order of March will be as we've introduced, again, uh, Skunk at the end will be the guy who's stimulating the conversation. With no further ado, I'll hand it over to Ann. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is my fifth or sixth GOE conference. Um, I haven't been, I wasn't here for the last two years, I have to wait, but it's good to be back. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit at first about meteorological satellites. I think what is unique uh, about Planet IQ on this panel is uh, not only the disruptive technology and the small sat business, but most importantly, and the most difficult uh, part of our business plan is uh, uh, changing the business model for weather forecast agencies around the globe. So Rob, with the next slide. If you, uh, I don't know how much of you are, how many of you are familiar uh, with the U.S. weather infrastructure, uh, but it's in shambles uh, for a whole host of good reasons and some very unfortunate bureaucratic reasons. Uh, but this does not tell well for the globe because the U.S., uh, if you add up all of the rest of the world, um, all of those budgets combined are half of what the U.S. spends on space-based architecture for weather satellites. And the U.S. weather satellites are in, have serious issues. To the extent that the General Accounting Office ranked NOAA's weather satellite program, particularly the JPSS satellite, uh, which is a polar orbiter in an afternoon orbit as a very high risk project and it's actually the second highest risk project in the federal government. Um, NOAA for some time debated whether or not we ran the is issue of a satellite weather gap uh, but NOAA has now uh, reevaluated the data and there is the real risk that our weather forecast is going to get dramatically worse. Uh, before it gets better. 
This at the same time that the Department of Defense has reevaluated re and gone through an analysis of alternatives to see what, what does the Defense Department really need for an all-weather force. Um, and out of that analysis of alternatives, the Defense Department is going to rely on NOAA, on foreign partners. Uh, they will fly what they absolutely must, where they have a unique requirement, and if there is a commercial sector there to supply data, they will also turn to the commercial sector. So next slide, Rob. So this is a very, very similar situation to what happened in the imagery world. I'm going to leave that part of the story out of it for a minute. Here are four sectors, race-based, big business, that were once a monopsony, a government-controlled monopoly, that are now commercial ventures. We look at satellite comms in the 1960s when President Kennedy set up the first quasi-private public satellite comms. That's now a $20 billion a year market, um, largely provided by the commercial sector. And General Shelton went on record about uh, two months ago now saying uh, all of the satellite comms for uh, the DOD or for the Air Force could be supplied by the commercial marketplace. Look at the space shuttle. Who would have thought eight years ago that we would have commercialized the space shuttle and we would have private companies competing to fly our astronauts into space? Then, let's revisit the imagery world. So back uh, in the early 2000s when Orbital and Space Imaging and the other companies were trying to come out of the ground, I actually worked for NOAA. And I was NOAA's representative to the Civilian Application Committee, to the intelligence community, on all imaging issues. And I'm quite familiar with the long, hard birth, if you will, the long, hard, ugly birth of the commercial imagery world. NRO was not motivated, NGA at that time, NEMO, was not motivated to let the commercial companies come out of the ground, nor was NOAA that had to supply the imaging license. But it was the exact same situation. The FIA architecture was dramatically over budget and dramatically behind schedule. And the warfighter ran the risk of flying blind. And that became an unacceptable risk to the DOD. And there was born the beginning of the clear view, next view, and now enhanced view contracts. One could say that that commercialization was very bumpy, but I would also draw your attention to the fact that the commercialization of satellite comms took over 50 years. The commercialization of imagery has taken 15 years, and now we're seeing the next generation and the next set of innovation. The commercialization of space transportation took about seven to eight years. This is happening faster. Why? Because it makes good sense. There don't, this, these, space is not as difficult as it used to be. It's still difficult, it's still risky, but this is an area where the commercial sector, I believe, has a lot to offer government. So Planet IQ is looking to be the first commercial weather satellite company on the globe. I do have a direct competitor. To me, that's a great sign means it's real. And I have a competitor, <coughs> someone who's looking, a company that's looking to fly a similar, uh, a similar business model with a very different type of data. And that company is called GeoMetWatch. Next slide. So let's talk about why this business model needs to be disrupted. It is very difficult. I've spent 18 years in government. I love the mission. I enjoyed every day that I was there. I'm very passionate about the mission. But we set up our democracy to move very slowly. Um, Congress, the last three or four Congresses in the next five or ten, are making that <coughs> democracy move even more slowly. It's exceptionally dysfunctional. It's very difficult to plan programs of this nature with uh, the take a three or four year engineering and requirements analysis, and then a two year procurement that's inevitably going to be protested, and then wait for a launch because you were unable to put your money down on the launch. Oh, and then 12 years later, you're launching technology that was developed 14 years ago. Technology is moving quickly, particularly in the weather arena. If you think about weather, weather is just a finite element model. 
that we dramatically undersample right now. And it is a global, social, public good. Every citizen of the globe deserves a great weather forecast. Weather is also a huge business. Um, and the business requirements for weather and climate and the changing climate, uh, regardless of whether what the reasons for that change are, business is now betting that there is change afoot. And in order to minimize the risk to their revenue, they want to understand more about it. So you have the government with a slow pace of innovation, with an aging fleet of satellites, with very inefficient procurement mechanisms because they were set up to be inefficient. It's not the government employees' fault. Up against growing commercial demand for data, market-driven information, our ability to innovate quickly. We have yet to launch the first satellite, and we're looking at innovations that are going to go on 13 through 18 already because we're free to do that. Um, and the disruptive economics. So, next slide. Um, so I wanted to leave you with just a, a few bits about the technology itself, because uh, it, this is a small sat, uh, session, and I do want to talk about the technology. Um, this is a GPS radio occultation technology, and it's made possible by measuring the rising and setting GPS signals in MEO. Uh, we'll be down in LEO. We'll have, at first, 12 satellites in LEO. They'll catch those signals as they bend through the atmosphere, the GPS signals as they bend through the atmosphere. Uh, we can measure that bending angle. If you back, uh, back down on the ground, you look at the timing on that bending angle, and you can back out temperature, pressure, and water vapor. From about 100 meters to the surf, from the surface back out to the ionosphere. We'll also have um, a number of uh, solar flare instruments on board. Um, and that will give you a profile. We're looking at 18,000 profiles a day, equally spaced around the globe from the surface back out to the ionosphere of the most accurate measurement of temperature, pressure, and water vapor that exists. I heard that wrong. Next slide. And uh, I already talked a little bit about the architecture. The first 12, we will launch four in 2016, eight in early 2017, all will be on orbit. Um, we will have a radical uh, difference in the technologies that will be moving the data in real time. We'll go up to an Inmarsat terminal, come back to the ground, post-process the data, and be able to distribute that data anywhere in the globe within three minutes of the observation being taken. That in particular is of great interest for ionospheric weather, for solar flares, for radio comms, satellite comms, power grid operators. Um, and it is also of interest when there are now casts being done. Think about the, the Midwest in the middle of tornado season when forecasts are being run very, very quickly. Next slide. That's it. Third GeoInt, first time speaking, and um, it's quite fitting because my, my community is a small satellite community, um, more so than, uh, than the GeoInt community. And I think that uh, what, what you're doing in using small sats for new business models is, is actually one of, the, one of the core things, hopefully, that we'll get out of today when we get to the panel. Um, but that's good. So, so I want to talk about two things today. One is uh, Plant Labs, give a little bit of an overview of, of, um, of who we are and what we're doing. And then next, I have one slide on a couple of topics that would be great to dig into at the panel. Uh, next, please. And next. So Planet Labs, we are, um, we are a privately funded company. We're a venture capital uh, funded company. Started three and a half years ago. Um, located in San Francisco. And um, we are an earth imaging company. So we design, build, manufacture, and operate um, um, small imaging satellites. They're five kilograms in a 3U form factor. And we've launched 32 of them since we started the company. Uh, we, we do this in an iterative fashion. So we call it agile aerospace. Um, how we build um, spacecraft every two or three months, bringing in new technologies as they come online, as well as um, redesigning the spacecraft for manufacturability. Um, and next so to back up for a little bit and why I ended up leaving NASA to start this company was the realization of a number of different converging trends. 
uh, it's getting cheaper to build spacecraft. Um, it's getting cheaper to build spacecraft because of billions of dollars that have been invested in, in other commercial industries, such as in consumer electronics. Um, and then the supply chains that actually make that possible in the manufacturing of consumer electronics. Uh, then the second technology that has made this possible is, is the proliferation of data and the storage and compute and the commoditization of storage and compute for that. Um, and so when you, when you see these technologies, these hard technologies, it decreases the barrier of actually doing something interesting in space. Uh, the next is more frequent access to space, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that, but the last dozen years, uh, being able to uh, ride up to space's secondary payloads. Um, and if you're a little bit more um, agile about where you go, uh, then you can actually get into space more frequently. Uh, and the last is a bit of, of my background. I actually grew up learning how to build spacecraft as small satellites in university and, um, and all the way through NASA and, and now. So this is actually the way in which my team, we know how to build spacecraft. Um, and, um, and at NASA, I don't know how many of you guys have worked at NASA, but it's actually a fairly um, meritocratic organization where you pitch a new mission. Uh, so we got really used to kind of pitching missions and buying down risk and doing that stuff. And it turns out that that was actually very similar to what you need to do if you're pitching venture capitalists to get money. Uh, next. So we left NASA and we started in our garage, as any good Silicon Valley startup does. Uh, you can see in the lower right-hand corner there, that's build one. Uh, that is uh, the first build of our spacecraft. Um, and uh, we, we knew what we, that we could build spaceships differently, and we thought through dozens of different new missions that we could do from science to exploration to commercial, and uh, realized the largest lever that we could have for the sector that we cared about, which is the aerospace sector, was to, was to do it commercially. Um, and also realizing that um, a commercial space venture isn't necessarily just the hardware or the satellite or the launch vehicle, but it's actually in the information, so that you have orders of magnitude more people that you can sell your product to. Um, and uh, we, we looked at uh, the commercial space sector, and while um, uh, and it's telecom, and as it exists today, telecom and imaging. And in, if you can redesign the space sector uh, in order to the space segment in order to disaggregate your satellite into multiple different nodes, uh, we decided to do um, an imaging mission. And any in imaging mission is is a point design of of, of five things. It's your Spatial resolution, your image quality, your coverage, so it's swap width, um, your currency, how frequently you can update that, and your overall cost. <coughs> so we did a capabilities based approach and a 3U form factor to differentiate on the latter three things, which is coverage, cadence, and cost. Uh, next, please. Um, so we're a completely vertically integrated company. We have zero aerospace suppliers in our supply chain. Uh, we are on our 10th iteration of the spacecraft. We're probably on our fourth iteration of the ground segment. Uh, we have about uh, eight ground stations throughout the planet. Uh, we have launched four satellites into space last year as tech demos, just purely to test operations and mission control, as well as the, the satellite itself. Um, and then um, in January this year, we launched 28 satellites. And they went up to the um, International Space Station on a commercial cargo mission. Um, and then they were deployed um, via the Japanese airlock uh, at the end of February, <coughs> at a time, uh, from the International Space Station. So 28 satellites are now in a 52 uh, kilometer orbit and um, our 52 inclined, 52 degree inclined orbit, um, and we are currently checking them out right now as we're going through. And I have a few pictures coming up. Uh, but before I get to that, I guess what I want to also talk about is more of um, our commercial platform that we're building. And so this is, all the space stuff is, is inside the company. It's an internal cost center for us. Uh, and what, what we're building is um, a commercial product. So we first went to um, um, agriculture companies and mapping companies and value-added service providers to find out what they actually wanted. And they really wanted imagery on demand. They wanted to be able to see it before they buy it, and they wanted to be able to do some, some compute against it. And so um, this is uh, an always-on constellation. We're doing a monitoring capability rather than a tasking capability. Um, and you can actually see the data before you go ahead and do analysis or, or download it or buy it. Uh, so this is a persistent global monitoring capability. And we have our work cut out for us this year because we have a few more constellations going up this year. Um, and um, we aim to have a commercially available product with general availability early next year where people can swipe their credit card and get access to these data. 
Um, I should state that we, uh, we, we thought about uh, the personal privacy stuff and the national security um, attributes of this very carefully and chose a spatial resolution of three to five meters per pixel so that we can, um, A, get at that differentiating thing, which is global coverage updated every day, um, and then B, not get into too much tactical national security issues and we get people used to consuming imagery on demand. Uh, and then as, uh, as the corpus of data grows, then, um, then that's when you can do some interesting analysis on the historic archive where you can see some, some, um, some precursor events before an event actually occurs. You can get to alerting stuff and, and, um, and actually more predict activities. Next. So this is uh, flock one. We call our satellites doves. And uh, the first flock of 28 satellites, this is uh, in our lab in San Francisco in, in, uh, in uh, December. Next. Uh, here you can actually see two of them being ejected from the International Space Station. This is actually really cool because astronauts were taking pictures of, of your satellites as they're being ejected, which uh, typically does not happen. Um, next. And a lot of great imagery. Next. Next. Uh, this is a week and a half ago. We have a five meter dish we just uh, erected down in uh, South Island in New Zealand. Next. Uh, here you can see Mike uh, looking at uh, uh, looking at Flock 1, uh, the, um, the, the spacecraft were ejected about three weeks apart. Um, you can see how there's a clump on the, on the uh, north part and a clump on the southern part. We use differential drag because we don't have active, uh, active uh, propulsion on board in order to do that. But uh, over the next six weeks, they'll be evenly distributed uh, throughout the orbit. Uh, here's what a mission control looks like. It looks more like uh, what a sysadmin would see if they're taking a look at their data center. Uh, that's, uh, we really just want to flag the operator to see what's operating well and what's not operating well. Okay. Uh, here's first flight of one of the spacecraft. This is of uh, Davis. This is about four meters per pixel. Um, and then, uh, so that's it on, on Planet Labs, but I wanted to, um, to also highlight a couple of things that would be great to speak about on this panel today. Um, one is um, Small satellites have the ability for us to rethink the space sector a little bit and get away from the vicious cycle of, of, of risk aversion within the aerospace community. And um, that's due to launch on one side and the, space and the space segment on the other side. And with secondary payloads, you can kind of suspend disbelief around the launch side and begin to innovate on the satellite. Um, but, uh, the, and, and there are very good reasons why we're kind of stuck in this, in this world, and it's because when we have 70 global launches for $300 billion of economic activity, you want to make sure that your billion dollar asset is really going to work. Um, and if that's really going to work, then the, then the rocket has definitely have to work. Uh, then, then you end up with the fixed cost in order to get access to space, uh, then, uh, then not frequent access to space, and you get into this vicious cycle. So small spacecraft um, can allow for us to um, test out new cost points and risk posture toward what we do in space in order to actually accelerate our space capability. Um, and then when you disaggregate the space sector, the space segment into multiple nodes or multiple sensors, then you can come up with new missions that otherwise weren't possible before. Um, and uh, if you think about space security aspects as well, you can actually disaggregate the risk into multiple nodes. Um, and then as, as launch becomes more responsive and space traffic become more responsive, then you could also um, you can also replace systems on a temporary basis. Um, also, that uh, I mean, as a bit of a pr provocative thing too, what would happen if the space segment actually does become commoditized, and that the that the business is really about information business? And we see how much uh, industry has actually accelerated over the last uh, dozen or so years because there actually is a lot of true market forces and investment going into that. So, what would happen with our sector if, in fact, this does? really take off and becomes truly commercial. Uh, but then the last point is that, um, that uh, we have Planet IQ and Planet Labs up here, and Microcosm as well. We're three of dozens of, of uh, new startups that are doing things in space. This really truly is a bit of a space renaissance. Um, and uh, where private investment is coming in and, and trying to come up with new commercial models and how things are done. But uh, the question is also for the, for the government folks in the room is, um, what is the role of the U.S. government in this? Uh, we, we truly are the, uh, the best place for the access to get capital, risk capital, the United States for short, in addition to talent. 
Um, but there are um, more non-U.S. companies that are doing new things in space than U.S. companies doing things in space. And so what really truly should be the role of the United States government to do that? Um, small satellites, I think it, it, it does make a lot of sense for that to happen here. Launch is even more difficult to happen here because of regulations and range costs and so forth. So some of the nanosat launch capabilities that are coming online uh, may actually be uh, more competitive overseas. Um, but with that, um, I'll leave it there. And also we had to have them tethered so you could actually see it. They were so small, how could we determine where it was? Well, it turns out Robbie was in school and he worked on that back, back then in the, in the early 90s. Uh, after that, we, I'm sorry, yeah. And then uh, after that, uh, aerospace uh, made them a little bit larger and they were still considered our PicoSat class. They were about five inches uh, square. But through some conversations with the professor at uh, Stanford, Bob Twiggs, uh, he saw it as an educational vehicle for his master's program, so he ended up creating the CubeSat program, which is a 10 centimeter square, uh, square box. I asked him once why he picked 10 centimeters instead of our 5 inches, and he said that's because he brought in a box from home to make his case, and that happened to be the size of a Beanie Baby box. So that, that was the origins of the CubeSat. So uh, over the years, we, we've been continuing to evolve and prove that you can miniaturize uh, every component necessary to fly a capable satellite uh, in very small packages. Uh, and a lot of the you know, arguments about you know, physics and, and things that just cannot be done because of optics size and whatnot, they continue to be challenged. And, and early on, aerospace just reached a conclusion that at the very least, just doing tech demos was important to move, move this industry forward. So. Uh, this timeline is really just showing us doing things uh, every, every iteration, just improving them and, and getting better and better. And we even have a derivative product, that round looking thing, it's called a re-entry breakup recorder. Uh, it is actually a cousin of uh, our PicoSat program to measure uh, the environment as things try to break up as they re-enter into the uh, atmosphere. That's actually been licensed and commercialized. Uh, Rob, can you try to get the video going? So for me to kind of wrap up here, uh, one of the things that aerospace has always been a, a believer in is actually that at some point in the future there would be a planet labs. So I feel good about being able to sit next to someone that proved us right way back then. Um, but one of the other things that, uh, that we, we uh, continue to do is, is try to improve the performance of these satellites so that they could actually get recognized and respected as, as doing serious missions, not just toys, not just education, but they really could augment and supplement the, the bigger vehicles. And, and I think with all the budget constraints and sequestration, it, that's become more and more pertinent. And, and with all the different launch vehicles and the ride share opportunities, that's become more pertinent. So um, what this is loading up is just a little demo of a flight over Australia. And we, what we were 